Well, hi, um, welcome to this week's podcast. And today I've got the privilege of meeting somebody that I'm meeting for the first time today, which is quite unusual for me on my podcasts. Um, a lady called Fiona Christie, we've met through Facebook. Um, I'm currently building a, a coaching business and using Facebook as part of that platform. And Fiona is doing the same and we, we connected and um, it was Fiona actually that mentioned a podcast because Fiona does her own podcast. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to have you on. And um, Fiona is a, a coach and an author. And what I would love to do, Fiona, um, is say, well, welcome, firstly. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, thanks, Mel. No. <laughs> That's great to be here. Um, you're out in uh, uh, New Zealand. Um, That's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I would just love for the listeners to learn a bit, a bit more about Fiona in terms of, you know, where you've come from, a little bit about your background. Obviously, this podcast is all about not settling. Um, and, I, and I know that you, you've sent me some information which proves that that's definitely in your DNA for not settling. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I would love you to give them a little bit of about, you know, a little bit of background about Fiona. Oh, thanks so much for the intro, Mel. It's great to be here. And you can tell from my accent, I'm not from your part of the world. <laughs> um, yeah, so gosh, it's been a really amazing journey. Um, and I wouldn't change it for a moment. But I guess in terms of settling in, you know, oh, I'll start at the beginning. Yeah. So I was born... Um, three and a half pounds and was very sick my mother had hem hemolytic anemia which meant I think in a nutshell her blood was incompatible with mine so I sort of nearly died and she nearly died and so it was a bit of a rocky start and um but I wasn't prepared to settle for that you know so I fought and um after a few months in an incubator I was out you know into the world but because I was a tiny little child um my family kind of wrapped me up in cotton wool as what happens with, I think, small babies and children. And so um, every time I couldn't do something, it was sort of, well, that's okay because you're small. You know, not intentionally. They had absolutely my best interest at heart. But I, I formed a belief very young that I couldn't. And so I went through my formative years. Um, it's interesting to use that word settle at that time, but not really doing anything, not believing I could, not even really, I was a remedial reader and had trouble learning. Um, and now I'm an author, so you can see there's been a lot of not settling here going on. Um, and so when I was 21, I read my first book in its entirety. I could read before that, but incredibly slowly. And after that, I thought, oh, maybe I can do some more stuff, you know? So I, you know, things slowly started to change. And then I discovered personal development, as most coaches do. And that was really the platform for me going, hmm, I think my life could be different instead of settling for being the person who doesn't know stuff, has to be in a shitty job or whatever. How old, um, how old were you? So at 21, you read your first book. What I'm intrigued to know what that book was. Can you remember? It was called gosh and I can't even I've never found it again it, I was in London actually and it was the thickest book I've ever seen in my <laughs> life I could have chosen something tiny but I didn't uh, um I was just walking past a bookshop and the book jumped out at me it was called Bird of Paradise but I think there's many books by that name and I don't know what who the author was but I was fascinated it took me on months to read it because my reading was slow as slow um anyway then when I was about probably 24 or maybe 25 I discovered personal development and went on my first course and then I discovered Louise Hay as most people do and she's the author of she's passed away now but um, you can heal your life and that book was instrumental in changing look I'd been settling for the fact that I was um, not able not capable or not feeling capable but that was a, just a big belief system that I had running so I got married um, and at quite young and, um, you know, I still hadn't developed that I'm good enough gene yet, really. Um, and so settled in a marriage that really I wasn't that happy in. And that was 
quite a few years. And then, um, you know, I discovered coaching and other things along the way. And I just thought, hang on a minute, this is not what I want for my life. It was just like this big wake up moment. And I thought, no, I have to change. This isn't me. So I took a leap of faith, left that marriage. Um, I'd there, never lived on my own before. Was there a moment like how, so you were in that marriage for a few years. You were quite young. Oh, quite a few years, like 18. Well, we were together 18 years. I was married oh, for 15 wow. years. And, yeah. So a long time. How long of that 15, 18 years did you know that you were settling? Probably. 17 <laughs> yeah probably oh you know really I remember you know this is, sounds terrible I can remember walking down the aisle and thinking have I really thought about this you know it was like something you did you had to have a man in your life or whatever you know and that I, I had this belief that I couldn't really look after myself I'd never lived on my own before I'd always been someone's you know daughter girlfriend whatever so then the natural progression was to get married and you know all of that kind of stuff and I never thought of myself as a career person um so I settled for that you know and it was I, I wasn't happy I was like the I'll be happy when girl yeah and um you know one day I just thought oh no it was really oh yeah I'd been to live in Adelaide we'd come back to New Zealand and and we'd gone over to live in Adelaide and over there I experienced something quite different I managed to get myself up to being a manager of a team of it's kind of like a typing pool in those days and I loved it and I was able to bring personal development into the you know fold and and sort of I guess teach these women that are, were working for me kind of another way of looking at life and I thought wow this is amazing I can you know do something else you know it was like I think that was the catalyst for it really so that was later yeah. on was it in the marriage so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I have got, you know, so I think the not settling for me, it it happens in layers, you know, I, I well, for me anyway. Um, and so you'll get to a, a certain point and then you'll, there's a not settling there and then keep moving forward. So I've made a huge changes in my life and people kind of go, oh my God, you just go and do stuff. But underneath I'm thinking about it and I'm brewing about it. But then I go, no. I'm settling no more I'm not doing that anymore the biggest not settling for me happened um, about four and a half years ago and uh, so I've been married twice and the second time after the second marriage you know kind of ended and we separated I thought I'm not doing this it I'm not repeating this again until I figure this out until I figure a roadmap that I don't have to be in this place again and really the catalyst for me for not settle was we had a major earthquake and I was living on my own oh yeah and um yeah and I had to evacuate my home that I'd bought even though I couldn't really afford it because I'd come out of the marriage um with not a lot of money and again that was settling and I realized I was sitting up on top of the hill. I'd evacuated my home. I was sitting in my car with the cats in the back. And I was like, hang on a minute. This is not what I signed up for. There is way more out there for me. I'm not settling anymore. That's it. I'm selling my home that I love. Um, but for a reason, I want to get back to coaching. I love it. And that's what I want to do. And I'm going to figure out a way to do it. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to build a tiny house that I always wanted to and somehow I'm going to make it happen. Just let me, yeah. um, I, I just had a wonderful image there of you sitting on this hill and it was a real, yeah. it was a real prophetic image in as much as, so that earthquake, if it's the same yeah. one I'm thinking of, um, but my it was son, a 7.8, yeah, it was massive. What, what year was it? Oh gosh, I think it was, two, ooh, gosh, I can't remember, it would have been. Maybe 10 years ago? Away not quite no that was the Christchurch one this ah. was in a place called Kaikoura and so that we I wasn't centered in Kaikoura but because it was so big it absolutely shook and we had the tsunami warning and I had to evacuate and I didn't realize the place that I was in was actually in the tsunami zone because that was hard to determine on the map did your house actually crumble down no it didn't but I did have some damage yeah right. 
because I was just having this, I was just having this image of your house literally collapsing and you're sat looking from the hill thinking you don't want to be where you are and and your whole life collapsed in front of your eyes. It's it's pretty much, I think, what's going on in the world today. You know, systems yeah. are collapsing, aren't they? Because yeah. Yeah. Um, it's making way for hopefully better things in the future. And um, yeah. you, you've got to let the old crumble and die, if you like, to allow totally. them to come in. Yeah. So sorry, I, I just, I just had all of that are... going on in my head. So. <laughs> but it's true. It was a metaphor for it was so amazing. I just sat there and all of a sudden this thought came in, which was. I don't want this shaky ground I'm living on. No, you know. I can't go back to this, you know, I just can't. It was almost like this breakdown to break up, you know, to, to get back up again. And I started putting things in place. I started looking at tiny houses and started getting my house in order. And a friend, great friend who's gone back to live in Scotland, had sort of was helping me get my place looking spick and span. And in the meantime, once I started looking at tiny houses, see, this is this amazing what, what, thing. What's tiny house? What do you mean by tiny house? Oh, wow, they're amazing. So tiny house, there's a big movement where people are living in um, tiny houses on wheels. So they're movable, um, sort of a bit like a caravan, but made okay. of wood and, you know, right. like a house, but small. And I thought, Deep as you know, one way of me getting back to coaching and getting rid of the debt that I don't want anyway is I could build this tiny house and I could live in it and I could just plunk it somewhere. I'm sure I could find a bit of land that I could lease, you know. And um, so in the process is what happens with when you take that first step of not settling, then things have a habit of, you know, the pathway unfolds. Yeah. And so I'm busy looking at tiny houses and I'm traveling around the country, staying in them and trying to find a builder and didn't like what I saw. And then um, through a friend, I met my now life partner, David, who just happened to be a joiner. And I don't know what you call them in your part of the world, but as someone who works with wood and makes yeah, things. Yeah. Same, same. And um, so we got together and he became interested in tiny houses so we started looking around together and I was always going to build it and then and then I put my house on the market and it sold in two weeks which wasn't what I was expecting so I um, <laughs> thought perhaps where am I going to go now so I ended up coming up here which is where David lives and he had seven acres and a organic lifestyle property um, and then I said well why don't you build my tiny house and um, he said, oh, no, that I, I wouldn't want to work for you. And I went, why not? You've got to work for someone and you hate your job anyway. So he did. And um, I've never lived in it because I was living with him. And then I Airbnb'd it. And then I thought, well, you know, I was in a job that I really, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I wanted to get back to coaching full time. And I thought, right, that's it. I had another light bulb moment and another it's almost like the not settling comes on the back of what some people might think is breakdown or catastrophe or whatever and I remember getting up at two o'clock in the morning and I'm lying on the lounge room floor and I'm thinking is this what it feels like to have a stroke or something I just feel oh I'm so stressed and I thought this is ridiculous life is short what the hell am I doing get on with it and do what you love. So I took two weeks off. I rang them and said, I'm not doing this anymore. This is stressful to the max, can't do it. And so, you know, I took that first step and they said to me, well, what would you do? And I went, oh, you know, so they just said, well, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I'd like to work two days a week. They said, fine, we'll make it happen. You know, like, wow, wow that was <laughs> unexpected. Uh, and then finally, eventually I, I left. You know, was that, the, gov was that the government job you put down on your email? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what yeah. was that doing? What was the actual job? Oh, so I was an instructional designer, which basically means I design learning materials. Um, so e-learning and workbooks and, you know, I have to work with subject matter experts to come up with the material and then put it together. And sometimes I would facilitate, but most of the time I would just create the materials. So, yeah. Okay. So I was a, I was a senior advisor in, in that role. Yeah. And then you went to two days a week. 
And then I went to two days a week. And then eventually I said, can't do it anymore. So I thought, well, how can I fund this in another way? So I sold my tiny house to a wonderful woman who's actually living on the property. Um, You know, and I, we have a um, a thing called, um, well, it's called KiwiSaver. It's like a retirement thing here. And I thought, right, I think I can access that. So I applied to access it and I bought into the property that I'm now living on. So It's like everything has fallen into place. And that's because I wasn't prepared to settle. I thought, no, I'm not settling in this shitty job that I don't love. It's okay, but I'm not feeling like this is where I want my life to head. And, um, you know, listen to faith. Yeah, yeah. And listening to your story really, really reminds me of the surrender experiment. Have you read that? No. Oh, Oh, my goodness. What's out of that? Oh yes, you need to you need to write that. Uh, read that. It's uh, by Michael Singer. Do you know Michael Singer? No. He, I mean, he was most famous for his first book, which is called The Untethered Soul. Okay. Um, I've read that book. Try to read that book a couple of times, and I don't think I am spiritually, consciously in the place to receive it as it was right. written. Um, so I will keep going back to that book till I finally the penny drops but it it hasn't yet but the surrender experiment is it's a phenomenal very easy read by the way it's not it's not a long book but it's the story of his life and he basically surrendered to the universe and and that was the experiment, right? So rather than trying to control things and all the rest of it, he just allowed himself to surrender. And he just wanted to be a hippie in the woods. That's where he started. And, um, you know, and, he, and it, the book starts with this chatting voice in the head. And he's like, he's trying to, he's like, what the hell is this goddamn voice, you know? And, and that's kind of where it all starts. Um, and my partner who is, he's a left brainer, he's an engineer and, um, I mean, me and him have been friends uh, for 24 years and we only got together last year. Um, wow. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> basically, we basically met. Um, I joined his band because um, I'm a oh. singer and uh, he plays guitar. And that's where we met in 1997. And um, he's been married. I went to his wedding. He came to my wedding, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And anyway. But he, for years and years, I've been trying to get him to meditate because he suffers a bit with anxiety and he's very stressed at work, very stressed at work and couldn't get him to do it. He kept saying, yeah, yeah, I know you're right. Yeah, yeah, I know you're right. Um, Anyway, I bought him the Surrender Experiment for Christmas and he absolutely loves the book and he's now meditating every day on the strength of the book. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Oh, I'm going to read it. Yeah, (laughs) it's definitely worth reading. Um. Okay, so yeah. That word surrender is like I was talking to someone about that today, and um, it's actually the final um, module of my The Internalist Way course. It's called Surrender. Right. Um, and Internalist follows the word, so the course follows each letter of the word internalist as one of the modules, and the final one being the S is surrender. And it's like sometimes when we can clutch on so hard to something and wanting it to happen and wanting it to happen. And so many times in my life when I've just gone, okay, you know, I surrender, you know, whatever will be, will be. And literally sometimes within minutes, an idea will come or, you know, it's it's just amazing. It is the most incredible thing. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're on about. I mean, I, in terms of how I'm now coaching um, and still building up the business, you know, I'm, it's still like yourself, earlier days. Um, but I was made redundant last year as a result. Well, they said as a result of COVID, it wasn't. They were just having a, uh, a restructure, quite a, the, the company I joined, I was there five years. I was only ever going to be there a year. It, it was my way of getting myself proper job um get myself back on my feet after you know the husband leaving and all that sort of stuff and uh anyway it lasted five years and I I think back to those five years and I I enjoyed a lot of it but then I really hated a lot of it because it wasn't it wasn't who I was it wasn't where I wanted to be 
but I earned decent money um, and it, you know, it sorted me out, it allowed me to keep my house, it allowed lots of things. And I think back to that and I think it was absolutely necessary, even though it felt, even though it felt like, oh, I've got to hang on to this job um, because if I don't, I'm not going to be able to pay the bills, I'm not going to be able to do this, blah, 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 yeah. blah. blah. When I was made redundant, and I knew it was, I didn't know it was coming by the way, but I wasn't surprised that I was chosen as the first one to go. Like, there was a lot that, that went after me um, because if I'd have been making the decision, I'd have chose me as well because my heart was gone. My heart was gone a long time before I actually got made redundant. And I chose that opportunity to within, I think it was 24 hours before, no, it was 24 hours after I found out I was being made redundant. I was on a webinar that I'd been invited to. I didn't know what it was about with people I knew. Um, and it was a coaching opportunity and it was a, an opportunity to be accredited in a particular framework, which is what I've done. And I was like, well, if that's not the universe, giving me a massive kick up the arse to finally do, you know, what I've been talking about wanting to do for the last three years, four years or whatever I've been talking about. So, yeah, so I had to, at that point, go yeah I'm just going to surrender I'm going to go into this and as scary as it is and still is um you know especially when you've got people around you going do you think you should probably get another job you know just to make <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> and it's We're really... asking how's it going how's it going and you just have to say oh it's great yeah I know <laughs> yeah. yeah that's the dreaded question isn't it well you got yeah. you got you got some more clients have you um yeah 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 it's fine <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah so um but yeah hold it when you hold on you hold it away and yeah. when when you let go like you said all of a sudden those impulses will come those thoughts will come um I think it was Einstein that used to say he used to go fishing he hated fishing he didn't like fishing but it was the solitude that he got and that's where he would have his eureka moments because it was pure solitude quiet nothing distracting him nothing bombarding him I know that feeling of you get to that you don't even know you're doing it sometimes you kind of get to that frustration point and you're trying and you're pushing and you're trying and then oh you know it's like you're in your head and then you and then just walk away like with me I always laugh people laugh at me because I'll go to the toilet and I'll come out and go, oh, I know, because it's that silence, you know. <laughs> what else can you do when you're in there as you go to the toilet, right? Or I'm in the shower, you know. And then I'll go, oh, my God, I know exactly. It's my, I did, I, when my second marriage was, you know. I was going to ask you about your rocks. second marriage, yeah. How did well, that come about know, and how did it finish? Well, actually, it came about because... Um, I was sitting around with the girls I'd bought I, like having left my first marriage and you know head, headed up to Auckland I was in Wellington our capital city and I didn't want to you know anyway long story I ended up um, eventually buying a house it was the first house I'd ever owned on my own and I was like oh god what if I don't like it I loved it. it was like oh my god I'd sort of felt like I'd found myself and I absolutely loved it anyway after about 18 months the girls and I were sitting around one night having a couple of wines and um, I don't know, the subject of dating or something came up and I said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, oh, I've sort of been thinking about it. And they went, oh, and because I was always pretty much the adventurous one, which is weird because I came from being a like a, you know, tiny child, not that adventurous, but actually I, I was. It was just a front. And so anyway, they ended up putting this profile um in those days it was newspaper ad so we crafted this ad and it went in this newspaper column called contact and you know um people would read the ads and then you would I think the guys rang a number and left a voice message and you would ring in and check your voicemail and you know oh god I felt like I was going out for breakfast lunch and dinner seven days a week and then I thought oh no I'm not doing it anymore See, there's that surrender thing. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, I'll just check the voice message one last time. And there was a message from the man I married. And um, so we went out and we met and, you know, you know, rest is history. But I know looking back that I hadn't really, I didn't really allow myself enough time 
for me on my own, you know. And again, I was settling because I felt like I needed this thing, you know. So, how, well, so when your first marriage ended, did you just simply say to the first husband, I've had enough, I need to be, be gone? No, so um, he was... Yeah, he'd been made redundant and he started looking for jobs in Auckland. And I said to him, like, he wasn't hugely committed to the marriage, really. And I mean, unbeknownst to me until a little while afterwards, he'd had affairs and I kind of always suspected, but, you know. So anyway, he, he said, oh, I'm going to go to Auckland. I've applied for a job up there. And I said, well, I'm only going to come to Auckland with you if you commit to the marriage first. Um, and he said, oh, no and I said well then I'm not going to go so that was like this huge uh, you know oh god you know what am I going to do how am I going to look after myself you know so I've pretty much had a breakdown of I, you know thought I couldn't cope um my parents luckily came and helped me out and we went looking at places and I can remember you know here's this law of attraction thing so I'd kind of had this doom and gloom in my head oh this is going to be terrible and of course the places that we were finding for me to rent were terrible I remember coming out of one and my father saying well I wouldn't have my cat living in there you know sort of whatever and then we were driving along this really lovely street and my mother said stop the car you know there's a two let sign on that place over there and it was a historic homestead three stories it, it was beautiful and I sort of oh I kind of want to live in there oh well let's have a look so we walk up and there was a sign with a phone number and we're looking and taking down the phone number this woman opens the window and said would you like to come and have a look you know that that whole yeah. kind of thing once you get but before that I thought oh my god this is more than depressing I can't do this anymore I thought okay by that time I'd already trained as a coach and I thought you got to change your attitude. Otherwise, you're going to find shitty places that you don't want to live. So I started sort of, right, the perfect place is coming to me now. And I always attract really great, you know. So then, of course, we started to find them. I can't remember what we're talking about now. Oh, I, I was asking what, about, yeah, I was asking about how um, how the first marriage ended. But I was, in, so, intrigued, I was intrigued to know what time period it was before you met um, husband number two. Because you said you had been really... to probably 18 months, two years, you know, I can't yeah. remember 18 months or two years, but for me, because I'd never lived on my own before and because I was quite sort of, well, they use the term codependent, you know, like I really felt that I couldn't look after myself. I really needed to give myself more time, yeah. but I came from that fear base in those days. I was fearful of not having enough money. Yeah. Money and me weren't friends, you know, I didn't yeah. have this great relationship with money then. And so I was worried about this mortgage and worried about, you know, and so this, I guess, subconsciously, this might have been a way to, you know, not have to worry about that. Yeah. But actually, I was settling and I wasn't really, yeah, I mean, we had some great times, but I can remember when I started feeling like, oh, my God, not again, this isn't it, you know. But I was like, oh, I don't know if I can go on my own again. Anyway, I took myself off to a shaman weekend. Oh, wicked. And it was have the most done, amazing experience ever. Have you done ayahuasca, have you? No. Oh, okay. So what did you do on this weekend? Oh, man, it was just incredible. It was at a retreat out in the sort of, you know, countryside, I suppose. Oh, we talked to nature. We asked, I asked cobwebs for answers. <laughs> and, you know, leaves, a raindrop on the bottom. of The most amazing stuff. And I heard this voice which wasn't mine it was just like it was it's so different it's almost a silence voice I can't even describe it it was the most incredible experience and I would ask the question how can I let go and then I would look at these things in nature and the web would say see how I the wind's blowing and I break up but I rebuild myself again you know and I would see um, a pine needle with a droplet on the end of it and I would see my reflection in there and say you know you're just a reflection of what you believe about yourself if you believe that you can then you can you know like there's all this stuff it was the most amazing experience ever um, and so I just said I had to go and it was I t tell you what that was the most 
horrendous experience. I left and I found a place to rent, which was a cute little cottage. And I sort of thought there was a funny smell in there, but they'd been painting. Anyway, when I moved in, the smell didn't go and it got worse and worse. And I remember a courier coming to the door and even he said, what's that smell? And oh, anyway, I ended up giving my notice because they wouldn't fix it. We wouldn't figure out what it was. And on the last day, I thought, oh, I went and had a look under the house and there was a mice or rat's nest. There was a whole lot of household rubbish under there that obviously been under there for a long time and there must have been a rat's nest or a mice nest and the smell. So we wow. ended up having to move. So I was only there two weeks. I'd unpacked everything. Gosh. Thankfully some fruit, well, some women, I'd run a coaching course for a local women's um, center and they all said, we'll come and help you move. It was so amazing. All these women came and helped me. And one of them said, where are you going? I said, I don't know. I think I'm going to go and stay at the motor camp. And then she said, no, you're not. Come to my place. It was amazing. She was Buddhist and it was just the most beautiful, you know, it, it was lovely. It was just so serene. And so I spent six weeks there and then I found a little cottage to rent again and I was on my way. But, you know, did you know, like, those, did you know those women? Not well. <laughs> but, but you sort of knew them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew them. And this this one I had met before and she was lovely and I you know I could have gone and stayed with people but I just sort of felt like oh I just felt I'm broken I don't want to impose and and you know it was the last day and I was just going to go and book into this into a cabin in the motor camp and she said don't be ridiculous come to my place so I went okay <laughs> on a whim went and it was just it was just fantastic it was so peaceful and yeah it was the right thing to do wow <laughs> So, so that was surrender again, you know? Yeah. you you Because I'm listening to you, the amount of times you've moved and been looking for places to rent or buy or whatever. And I always fancied myself as a bit of a... I remember reading novels when I was younger about gypsy girls and all that, you know, very different in the novel to how they're portrayed now and all that sort of stuff. But I used to fancy myself being a traveller and, you know, be here, there and everywhere. But I've, I've not done that. <laughs> I've... I've been in this house 16 years, um, not because I didn't want to. I mean, I had, uh, when I was with my husband, we talked about going to Australia because he lived in Australia for five years. Okay, yeah. Um, he lived in Sydney before he had a motorbike accident and uh, he had to come back here. And, and that's how me and him ran into each other. We, we knew each other anyway from school. But um, so, yeah, so he'd always wanted to go back to Australia. I liked the idea, but my dad was not very well. And, being, you know, I always thought I couldn't wait to get out of where I live, Coventry. It's a, a city in England, yeah, close to Birmingham. And um, it's not the greatest city in the world, have to say, but, but it's home in lots of ways, you know. And, and I always thought I'd be here, there and everywhere. I wanted to travel. It, it feels to me like you've not had an issue in, all right, well, this ain't happening for me, so I'm I'm off and I'm doing something else, or I'm I'm going to find this place. I don't know whether I could be as fluent as that, you know. Well, the thing is, though, I always thought I wasn't. You know, it's funny how you think of yourself because I always thought, oh no, I'm not um, courageous, or I'm fearful of change, or. But when I think back, I thought I mustn't be because I did it. But I think I did it. You know, it was like this. Have to, you know, like. I've just got to do it I've got to you know it's so it's so interesting when you look back and you think you have this perception of yourself which is, yeah. actually isn't true yeah it's just, it's just not true um yeah no, absolutely yeah I think I think it was probably what I wanted myself to be I mean don't get me wrong I still want to go traveling and all the rest of it and live the live the laptop lifestyle or whatever you know and run your business from anywhere um with my partner at the moment, that wouldn't be possible because he's tied to a job. But I think there will come a day in the not too distant future where that will change. And then who knows, you know, and, and also kids keep you here, don't they? I've got a 22 year old. Yeah. He's got, he's got a 17 year old and he doesn't want to go anywhere until he's at least 18 and, you know, and all of that. Um, so there are other things that come into play that sort of keep you here. But I don't really know where I was going with that. I was about to ask you something from that um, and it's completely gone out of my head. I was going to th say something too. And I think, ah, oh, you know, you were saying about how I'd moved heaps. Well, 
I figured out quite recently that I think the reason why I did that was, you know how, um, well, here we call it, um, so our Indigenous um, people, they're called Māori, and um, so you have your your mountain, your maunga, and your um, river, your awa, um, or in my case, it's a roto, a, a lake, and they're your spirit place, if you like. And my where I was, and they're sort of where you're born. So I was born in um, a place called Taupo, or some people call it Taupo, and it's the biggest lake by the biggest lake in New Zealand. It, it is sort of my spirit place, but the but the reason why I think I felt like I never belonged anywhere was because I was born in another town that had a hospital that could cater for my birth. And I was there for six weeks or more. I don't even know how long in an incubator, not with my mother because she got cancer of the cervix and had to be moved to another big hospital. So I was there on my own, mm. you know, and in those days they didn't have that physical touch, you know, kind of thing. So I think that's why, all those years I didn't really feel like I belonged somewhere mm. and I'd always go in through my head well, if I wanted to live somewhere if I was going to move you know when I was going to separate from my husband my first husband people said to me well you'll stay in Petone won't you which is where we live and I said no there's not I don't know anyone here it's it's not for me you know and so I ended up moving back into Wellington City but I never kind of went oh I'd live there or I'd live there and I realize it's because I did have that connection to something mm. that had me rooted to, and it's not until I moved here, this is my place. I realize, oh my word, this is my place. It's like I feel, I found, you know. You come yeah. home. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So tell us a little bit about what your coaching is, um, who, who it is that you're helping. Um, and before we finish, I always like to ask um, a bit of wisdom that you could maybe give to the listeners um, and obviously how they can find you if they want to know more. So, um, sure. so what's the coach and, and what's the book that you wrote? I've write, written a couple and the first one was called Shopping List for Life. And um, it's a, sort of the, yeah, it's sort of the premise that, you know, when you go to the grocery store with a shopping list, you come home with the things you expect. Um, you haven't forgotten anything and you usually don't blow the budget. But when you go without a list, you know, you spend more than you thought. You've forgotten the essentials and, yeah. you know, you know, whatever. You bought more than you thought as well. So in life, we kind of need that too. We, we need a shopping list for our life. So it's kind of that premise. And it looks, that was kind of a generalist book and it looks at all the areas of kind of personal development and the things that you need in your life. And then that progressed on to the next book was in, it was when internet was in its infancy. So I did an e-course and it was delivered over 16 weeks, one chapter a week for 16 weeks. And it was audio in those days, as well as e-book. And that was called Shopping List for Love. So that was kind of how to meet the person that was right for you. And that process I used to meet my second husband. And, um, you know, people, I used to think, oh, people will think, you know, this is a bit of a fraud because it didn't last. But what I, what I say is, you know, we evolve, right? And we may evolve <coughs> with that person or we may evolve without them, you know, because yeah. we learn and we grow, whatever. So that was the second book. And the other one is called One Minute Goals. And that was kind of a, a workshop, if you like, but has morphed into a book. And that is really a consequence-based accountability system. Yeah, so it was like one day I just thought it was after I returned from living in England and I was, well, what am I going to do? And I woke up one night and I thought, write the book that you've wanted to write for ages, just do it. I was something and I was getting up every single night and writing in the middle of the night because that's when I'd get my inspiration. And just, I don't know, I never knew how to write a book, but I'll just do it and then I'll, you know, it's what happened. Just back up one minute. You, that's the first I've heard that you lived in England. When was that? <laughs> oh, gosh, it would have been in about 1984, I think. I was 21. And I followed the man over there that I ended up marrying. Ah, yeah. right. So I never, because I was a remedial reader at school and had trouble learning, I never knew anything about anything. You know, I didn't 
hadn't studied, I hadn't, you know, I didn't have any sort of qualifications. All I knew about the world was what you saw on the TV, you know, Coronation Street, whatever it was. And I remember standing in Trafalgar Square and going, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. You know, it was like this, wow, <laughs> it was a wake up call for me. How long were you in England then? Um, that, Two years, about two years, yeah. You lived in London, did you, or around there? Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. much. Just yeah. did the OE like most Kiwis, New Zealanders do. Yeah. And um, I went over with a bit of money, so we bought a combi van with that, intending to use it to travel around Europe, but we ran out of money, so we sold the van to get the money to travel around Europe and um, by train, and then after that we came back, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. Um, so, the, so the coaching you do now, so who is it that you're specifically helping um, and why? Okay, so um, it's interesting actually, because when you get into coaching, in the early days I was a generalist coach, but these days they talk about niching, Yeah, you know, weird word, but, you know, talk about who is it that you want to help. And it's took me um, a long time to go, who is it? What am I best qualified to, you know, and you always coach what you've been able to overcome yourself, you know, well, there's lots of things I've overcome, but I thought one day I just thought, you know what, I'm a woman in midlife, probably a little bit beyond midlife now, I'm 58. And um, I thought, you know, I've been married twice and I've learned a lot from that. And I realized that it's time I don't settle. And I'm not making those same mistakes again. So I wrote The Internalist Way, which is really, it's like a roadmap. And so that's what had me start again. So now I coach women in midlife who um, really want to go beyond their limitations. And they are saying to themselves, I, I don't know what I'm, what next, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's who I, who I work with. Fantastic. Women in midlife who are overcoming, you know, they're divorced, they're kind of moving on to the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, it's so, mm. so needed. Very similar to mine. Mine's, mine tends to be women who are feeling sort of trapped in that relationship still or, or are recently, you know, out of that. But, but through that process, they've lost who they are really and, and don't know what their purpose is or have lost sight of what their purpose is. So... Yeah. Um, and same with careers, you know, women that have settled in careers and stuff that's just made them miserable for years. And, and you forget, you know, when we're kids, we have all, I mean, I wanted to be so many different things. I went from being a hairdresser to an astronomer to a truck driver. My mom, oh, was, wow. my mom was gutted on that one. Um, photographer, <laughs> you know, they were <laughs> psychologist, everything. Um, and then when we get, you know, when we get wedged into a job, and also careers at school, like I went with this idea I wanted to be a photographer. That was around 15, 16, what, what, about that age. And they just said, nah, nah, you need to rethink that. You're not, you're not going to be successful in that. And that was, that, that was the careers advice. Wow. So, so even at school, you're like, you're told, <sighs> don't be ridiculous. You know what I mean? Um, so it's, you know, you can see why people settle. You can see why people just follow what's expected and all of that sort of stuff. And then, you know, it takes, it takes a person to either have a real breakdown, like you say, because before every breakthrough, yeah. you've got to have a breakdown. Yeah. Um, and some people don't recover from that, but those that do are the ones that almost are reborn, right? And it's like the, the phoenix from the ashes and all those are the cliches. Yeah. Um, but no, that, that, that's, yeah, so the point was, um, we're in a similar niche. Um, and, but it's so necessary, especially for women, because, you know, they do give up their identity when they become, yeah. pet, you know, when they become a mom or, you know, or depending on their husband, you know, a lot of the women I've spoken to, very controlling husbands. Yeah. Whereby they do lose themselves and they don't yeah. know how to get back out of it. They've sort of forgotten who they were when they were just just them you know um, well maybe they weren't even then they weren't they hadn't even stepped into the shoes of the woman that they belong to you know, that they yeah. belong to be it's like that it's self-belief is the first thing yeah. really yeah. yeah yeah and you asked me about the quotes that reminds me of 
I've heard them recently and I love it. They're my mantra at the moment. And the first one is no one will ever rise above the opinion they have of themselves. Yeah. That landed. I mean, it's just, ah. Oh. Um, and oh, what's the other one? No one will ever rise. I will never, no one will ever rise above the opinion they have of themselves. Ah, oh, there's a second one. And it's equally as profound. It, I mean, it's just so true. Oh, no one will ever love them. No one will ever love you more than you love yourself. Yeah. No. No. Something like that. But it's so true. And what I realized, this has been my biggest takeout since I left my full-time job about four months ago. It was like, you know, if I don't love me fully and truly, absolutely without a doubt, no one else is going to, yeah. you know, how do I expect to attract the relationship, the job, the house, the whatever? It's like, if I was, let's say I really wanted a relationship and if, um, if that relationship was, um, so if that person, how do, how do I explain it? Um, it's like, are they worthy of, am I worthy of them? You, would they want to have a relationship with me? You know, why would they love me? Mm. Do you know, because we often think, what are they going to give me? But what are actually, what am I, and what am I going to give them? Because mm -hmm. if I haven't got myself yeah. to the place that I'm totally in love with me then I'm not going to attract someone who loves me of course I'm not absolutely yeah. absolutely it's been a real epiphany for me mm. yeah I can relate to that big time I think it's no one will ever love you more than you love yourself yeah and that's true that is true um well thank you Fiona that has been I've really enjoyed this lap well it's not quite the hour but um just understanding the, the magical mystery tour that you've taken and you know those, <laughs> it those has moments, been. <laughs> yeah those moments of surrender and also the moments of of you know settling but then coming out of that and I think it's going to be massively uh, inspirational for our listeners um so thank you for sharing and if if anybody would like to reach out directly to you where can they find you Okay, well, my website is called theinternalists.com, but it's just as easy to go to fionachristie.com because it goes to the same place as well. Fiona, yeah, yep. that'd be the easiest place. And then if they wanted to email, they can do it from there. Yeah, and I can give you links anyway. You can put it in there. There's a, you know, some free downloads they can come and grab and, you know, yeah. Lovely. All right. Oh, I'd love meeting you. This has been so much fun. <laughs> Well, I'd love to do the return I'd love to hear your story more oh yeah <laughs> yeah I'm up for that definitely fantastic um, all right well um thank you again and um take care and uh yeah I'm, I'm keen to see what you do next so uh thank yeah. you I will be in touch for sure thanks for having me <laughs>